Talking to Lee Abbott, flying the replica of a Curtis Pusher. Lee, could you tell me about your plane? Uh, it was built by an uh, EAA group at Deer Park, New York, who were six and a half years building on it and never flew it out of an airport. I've owned it about a little over eight years. I've flown it 326 flights, and each flight is the event, as one of them was today. Uh, I've flown it. Uh, at Reno at the air races of Florida a couple times, six times here at uh, Navy Base in Corpus at uh, Omaha off of the Air Force. I've flown at quite a few places. Luckily, I've gotten back intact every time, but it's not a very good flying airplane. It doesn't, uh, it's not a lot of fun to fly when it's rough and hot. But I have, uh, I've flown, uh, started flying in 29, airline for 28 years during the war, and the last five years flew DC-7Cs, which were capable of flying for Braniff Airlines, capable of flying nonstop from Dallas to Paris if I had enough gas in. Also, I flew Dallas to New York and Chicago, but I also flew some charter trips at the company I had football teams, and uh, all during the war, primarily flew Dallas to Chicago, just past it, feel the airplane. Now, what else, Randy? Okay, could you tell, do you know any information about the original Curtis Pusher, when it was built? Uh, uh, you mean this one? Uh, the Curtis, of course, were building from about 1907 or 8 along in there and so forth, and every airplane those days was a different size and type, and they were still fishing. They weren't uh, like Model T's, where they all the same. This is about like they were in 1912 is heavier than this same size airplane. Most of theirs were a little larger than this. Uh, this is all welded inside. If it were not pretty strong, I wouldn't haul around the country and have fun with it. Uh, it looks enough like the original where if uh, Glenn Curtis was here, he'd know what we were imitating. Okay, do you have any uh, favorite stories, flying stories you'd like to share with us? Uh, with this? With anything. Well, I'm just fortunate to still be here. I've had a lot of things happen down through the line, whether it kind of minus the lightning burning antennas and holes in the wings, the landing once with one inch and feathered and three of them in reverse on the final, the two complete radio failures due to uh, electrical systems and so forth, to uh, baggage bin and seats pulled loose in the cabin in thunderstorms. And then ice up to where we kept reporting losing altitude and couldn't hold it, finally got the control of things. I've had a lot of things happen now through the years. How do you like your uh, piece of flying being followed by the Concorde? It's, it's a little beyond me. Uh, incidentally, some of my buddies who used to fly co-pilot with me flew Concords for a while for between Dallas and Washington and then the British flew in Washington Paris. And uh, I've talked to them extensively, and they said it took about two months training to get through all the systems to be able to fly it. Of course, any good pilot can fly another airplane if he's given an opportunity to get practiced up in it and learn the systems, assuming he's a pretty good pilot to start with. And I've flown the DC-7Cs that I flew. It was this large uh, four-engine airplane that was being operated before the straight jets came. And then in the early days, I have flown some trips when there was one round trip a day between Dallas and Houston and room for two passengers. That's all the service. Now there's about 
40 or so airline trips a day back and forth, and of course there's no railroad service. So I've seen considerable change. In the early days, they didn't have runways. When I first flew into Love Field at Dallas, they had no runways. It was the field was out in the country, now it's surrounded by buildups and so forth. And the airplanes then had no brakes, and they had no starters, and they had no flaps, and no a lot of things that nowadays people think they have to have. No radio, nobody to tell you where to go when to do it. So there's a whole lot of difference. A person who flew in those days couldn't get to first base on some of this stuff, but by the same token, I sold the Bonanza to a captain in the Air Force who was based at El at Laredo about three years ago. He paid my money. I went out twice to show him how to fly it, and it was hot and gusty. He'd make a fine descent, but he couldn't line up with the runway because he couldn't use the runner. A Bonanza has a tail like this, and it's kind of unstable and goes back and forth. And in the jets, on the takeoff, they run, use the nose wheel steering, and they don't use the rudder. So the result was we flew three times about an hour and a half of whack, and he'd bought it, and he finally went to Laredo and made it. But that shows the difference. He'd been instructing two years, teaching people to fly in that, and it flew so much different than another airplane. Okay, can you explain your unique style of starting your plane with uh, the help of two pullers? You mean what? Starting the plane, the engine itself, with the two pullers. Well, to uh, start it, if you stand in and if you stand in and pull it, hand pull it, you're too close to the propeller. So if you start it with the wires and things down here, you might trip and get into it. If you stand back of this brace, it's too far out when you can't get a good chunk. So I talked to my dogs, and they gave me their dog bowl, and I cut it up and put it on there, and I wrap rope around it, and that way we spin the motor good. It starts every time, even though usually when the starter men fall down, but that doesn't matter. I warn them in advance. If you haul the airplane a thousand miles or so as I have and get ready to fly and it won't start, you're kind of upset. But this way, well, we can really spin it. And nine times out of ten, I prime it, pull it through four compressions, wrap the rope five times, put three or four fellas on, bam, it's gone. Okay, that's about it, unless you want to say anything else. Yeah. Well, I might tell you that I'm 81 and 16 and still trying to hold. My two best buddies are playing the harp, and they're going to teach me how when I get there. And so it's kind of unpleasant going and flying it. They, both of them were Air Force or Chief Pilot of Braniff and so forth, and I'm traveling alone, and it's uh, a bit difficult. Maybe next year I'll have some other fellas broken in if I make it again. Okay, thank you. Thank Thanks you. So much.
Concorde is British Airways supersonic jet that flies at Mach 2, which is twice the speed of sound. It was a major display at the 88 fly-in and made five local flights of one hour each, which many consider a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. After its four-day stay in Oshkosh, it departed for London. Power is supplied by four Rolls-Royce Smecma Olympus 593 engines, which are mounted in pairs on each, each wing. Each engine is capable of generating 30,000 pounds of thrust. The Concorde carries 100 passengers, all first class, and crews at an altitude of 55 to 60,000 feet. Its cruising speed is approximately 1,300 miles per hour, which is twice the speed of sound. Bleistift? Ja. Feder? Ja. Haben Sie einen Bleistift? Nein. Äh, no. Darf ich meinen Bleistift spitzen? 
Spitzen die Bleistift. Das Leben ist schöner, aber teuer. Du kannst es auch billiger haben, aber dann ist es nicht mehr so schön. Life is nice but expensive. You can have it cheaper, but then it is not quite so nice. Ah. Yeah. Kind of like uh, people with a lot of brass so don't have enough polish, right? <laughs> good, good. Okay. I don't believe that you're 87 years old. You don't believe that I'm... No, no. Oh, I see. I don't believe that you're 87 years old. You don't believe I'm 87? Well, sometimes people are skeptical. Let me prove it to you, though, Fred. Fred, I've been flying since 1930 when I was 29 years old. This is my, my vintage license, my pilot license that I got in 1930. You see what happened, the reason I look a little bit younger than 87 is because in 1932, I had a brand new Travel Air biplane. This is the Travel Air that I had. And I was a bush pilot up in the Northwest Territory, now called Alaska. One day I was out on a mission and a freak storm was approaching, so I landed on an iceberg. When I saw the, the storm coming, I jumped out of my traveler, began running, and the ice, the freezing rain hit me and, and put me and my traveler into a frozen state of suspended animation. I just thought out last year, and I uh, saw that my vintage aeroplane, now vintage aeroplane, it was brand new at the time that I was flying it, had left. Someone had stolen my travel air, but the tracks were left lowering down, uh, going down to the lower 48. And so now I'm in search of my travel air all over the country. Have you seen my travel air? Not I. No? Not I. Well, I've flown in five of them since I've begun my hitchhiking journey around America, but none of them fly quite as nice as, as mine did. Uh, was it a 2,000 travel air or a 4,000? It was a 4,000. No, now I saw a 2,000. You did? Can you tell me where? I want to look this person up and uh, see if it's mine. Well, at 91, my memory's a little old. Yeah, uh, you're 91. You're older than me. That's that's good. I like older men. Oh, that's good. <laughs> well, have you thought out yet? Pardon me? Have you thought out yet? I'm I'm well thought, and uh, some people uh, tell me that my brain uh, <laughs> my brain is thawed too, <laughs> but they don't I mean, really know me. I'm really a sane you're, person. You're, you're warm. You're warm to the touch now, huh? Yes. Real warm to the touch. Uh, now, no, wait a minute. No, no, no. Now let's not get warm to the touch. Your arm. <laughs> now don't don't maul the aviatrix. Aviatrix. <laughs> I just want to see how if you're warm. That's all. Are you I, warm? I'm I'm warm. She yes. Warm. Some of these guys, boy, you gotta. <laughs> Aviators. Aviators. Oh, sure. <laughs> you know, they had a cartoon. Some have the devil in them. You know, she's an ace now. She just bagged her sixth aviator. You, you got to watch out for the, some of these aviators. Okay. But, um, well, look, that's very nice. That is very nice. Let me see. How, thank you. How did you come by that? I, I told you. Well, well, these are my, uh, some of my instructors were Wilbur Wright. Longway Corrigan was my uh, navigation instructor. And as you see, Roscoe Turner taught you've, me you've uh, how to fly. Monster, monster. That, is, that is magnificent. Thank you. Thank you. But uh, it's, got, uh, it's got white out. <laughs> He's discovered the white out. <laughs> That's really neat. Official souvenir of the... Cleveland Air Races. Yes. Okay. Sure. What, what do you have here? This is for you, for your travels. Oh! The 101st Aero Squadron. Fred! Gosh, this is so special. Well, whatever. This is so special. Well, I have something for you. This is lovely. I will wear this and cherish it. I have something for you also. You give me your pen, I will give you my pen.
I will make you an air adventurer. Would you like to join my club? I'm starting a club for people who love old aeroplanes. Well, sure. Okay. Let me... Uh, well, you better put it over. First, you must take the pledge, however. Uh-oh. Okay. Raise your right hand and repeat after me. To the best of my ability, to the best of my ability, I pledge to support. I pledge to support the ideals and principles. The ideals and principles of air adventurers. Of air adventurers. And will do all in my power. And will do all in my power to further the advance of aviation. To further the advance of aviation. Congratulations, Fred! You're our newest air adventurer. So help me, Richard Buck. <laughs> and I will give you your air adventurers membership card in a few minutes. All right, great. But but uh, in the meantime for being so kind and giving me this beautiful pin from the Royal Air Force, I would like you to have an Air Adventurer's wing pin. Oh, that'd be excellent. These go to honorary members. Uh, where would you like it? Right there? Put it right there. Okay. I'll pin it right there. Okay. Hey, how about You can button it. I will. Thank you. Thank you. You want, to go to, you want to go to dinner now? I would love to go to dinner. Let's go to dinner. <laughs> I was smitten. I've been smitten by Harry Quimby ever since I saw her. Oh, yeah. I'm trying to go, go back in time. That's why I thought maybe I'd pop in here. Oh, Come here. I'll help you with the airplane. I'm going to go inside here. Let me get the... Uh, let me get the... Uh, grab hold of there. Grab hold of the back of the Talking to Martha Ash. Martha, could you explain what you're doing here this weekend at the EAA convention? Well, I'm meeting a lot of the people that wrote me letters uh, with regards to my Barnstorming USA project. What I'm doing is I'm hitchhiking rides in vintage aeroplanes all over the United States of America for a six-month period of time. Okay, have you found any uh, unusual uh, things as, as on your way? I sure have. So far, uh, since May 28, when I began the journey, I've flown with 79 pilots through 19 states and have flown in uh, three P-51s, uh, three AT-6s, that's a warbird from World War II. Uh, I've flown in five travel airs from the late 20s and early 30s, four Wacos, uh, let's see, Stearmans, Cubs, and some one-of-a-kind airplanes like uh, Channing Clark's Fleet Wings Seabird from 1936. Okay. Besides the rain right now, we're having uh, air shows going on. What are you trying to accomplish with your, with your trips? Well, I'm just having a lot of fun, really. But uh, as I go along, I'm compiling information from people, notes from people about themselves for a book that I'm putting together about my air adventure. We have the pilot come in here from the plane. Your name, sir? My name is Fred Jung Claus. Okay, can you tell me a little bit about your plane here? Yeah, this is a replica of a 1918 SE-5A British World War I fighter. It uh, was made by the Royal Aircraft Factory in Hendon in England. Uh, this particular replica and numbers were flown by the oldest surviving American ace of World War I, who was the fourth ranked ace of World War I for the, for the United States side, uh, Colonel George Vaughn Jr., George A. Vaughn Jr. He flew for the 84th RAF squadron uh, up until mid-1918, at which time he came over the, to the uh, 17th U.S. Camel Squadron where he flew a stop with Camel. The Camel that he flew was replicated at the Air Force Museum, and I thought it would be really a, a tribute to the time he spent in the RAF to, uh, to replicate the uh, SE-5 in, in his colors. In 1977, I wrote him a letter, and he responded by that he had no photographs of his airplane, but he did make a drawing, and he was 80 at the time, of, of his squadron uh, insignia and all the, also the other markings. I had flown, I've flown this airplane the first time 
on June 29th of this year, uh, on July 2nd, I was able to call a general and tell him that the airplane had flown. A bigger thrill for me than him, certainly. Yeah, how many other events like this uh, do you attend, the plane? Well, I've only got 34 hours on this airplane totally. Uh, last weekend, uh, I was able to go to the Dayton Air Show and show it there. So I've only been to Oshkosh and the Dayton Air Show so far. But that's, again, within a, about a 30 four-day period. It comes out to about an hour a day. Yeah, what do you think about the program going on here? Uh, the, the biggest thrill of my life. Uh, one one fellow said, I live in southern Indiana, he said, how long did it take you to come here? And I said, 12 years. That's how long it took me to build this airplane. Three times longer than World War I lasted. <laughs> okay, anything else you'd like to add? Uh, that's about it. I'm just It's just a tribute to General George A. Vaughn, Jr., uh, the highest-ranking American ace in World War I still alive. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anything else, uh, Martha, you'd like to say? Where are you planning on going from here? I could ramble on forever if you wanted me to. Um, from here, I, I've got to go across the uh, top western states on over towards Washington and Montana, and then I'll zip back across the top and go through Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, up into the New England states, and then back down. And I should be back in Orlando, Florida, where I began my journey. Uh, should be there at Thanksgiving. Tell me your name and, and where you came up with this uh, unusual plane. Well, my name is Jim Hay, and uh, my brother actually came up with this unusual plane. It's his, it's his project or his creation. I helped him a little bit on it, you know. But I don't like to take credit for this <laughs> too much. That's my son there. He's going to put some water in here so he's going over heat. Maybe you ought to get some more, huh? That's that's uses quite a bit of water from flying too many uh, missions. Right. Well, yeah. It's from uh, running, sitting here idling in, the, idling in the sun. Idling in the sun too long. That's our cooling system right there. Like you just saw him put the uh, water in. That's our cooling system. What, what type of engine do you have? This is a Stover farm engine. I don't know. From about 1923 or something, and it runs, uh, I think it's about three horsepower, like that, two and a half, three horsepower. Where did you come up with the idea? Uh, my brother had this engine, and he wanted to put it in something, so he started out making this car, and he just ran it as a car. Well, then we were so involved in the air show, he thought, well, gee, i got to put wings on it, you know. And what he built this for originally is he runs it a lot in parades stuff around in our local area. Do you think you have a, a pretty good patent here for planes of the future? Oh, no, well, we, we, we tell anyone who wants to steal any of these ideas, feel, feel perfectly free to just take whatever they want. Okay, as far as that cannon, is that uh, operational? No, it's not. It could be made operational, though, but it's not loaded. That's why it's not operational. You need a you need a ball and some powder and a and a rag and a plunger rod, you know, to get it loaded. Which means that the spider airplane, once you got it in the air, would really only basically have one shot. It'd be a hell of a shot though when you shot it. <laughs> Do you have any uh, future plans for revamping or making improvements on this plane? Oh, I think it's gone as far as it can technically. I mean, I think this is as much improvement as, as anyone would ever want to see made to this thing, possibly made to it. It's all made out of the finest oak and the finest uh, rusty steel. Uh, one, one problem that's very common to aircraft is nuts and bolts coming loose. We found out that if you put just raw nuts and bolts on and let them rust on, they never come loose. You know, we've solved a lot of technical things that plaguing aviation industry for years. So the front wheels used to be about, oh, about this one tire. They just keep wearing down. How many landings, takeoff? No, taxiing tests. Taxi. Yeah, we're not we're not ready for the landing and takeoff yet. We figure about five to eight more years of taxiing tests, and then we'll be ready for the takeoff. Then we then we got to find a runway that goes downhill about 45 degrees. Ramp on yeah, and ends with a cliff, you know, there. And then we need a five-pound pilot who's really stupid, you know. <laughs> then you, we have, figure, you have trouble finding crew members? No, no. We, we just recruited my son here. <laughs> No, we don't have any trouble finding crew members. 
uh, finding clean crew members you have trouble. There's oil and stuff sprayed out of this thing all over. It's We are going to have trouble finding somebody who really wants to fly it, though. When we decide to fly, we're going to have somebody... Put names in a hat or something? Draw straws? It'll have to be something like that. I have to think of something more devious than that. <laughs> somebody you hate. They're like an odd man out contest or something. <laughs> the biggest loser of the week or something like that. You know, would have to be the one to fly it. No, not anybody I hate. No, no.